I want to start off and quote one of my favorite songs, and uh, maybe it will be familiar to some of you, and uh, a verse in that song might be the chorus. It says, heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. Now in Matthew 9 verse 35 to 38 in the message it says, Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. On your knees, pray for the harvest hands. His heart broke. He had compassion on the people, on, on the crowds. He was moved with compassion and it was a deep concern he had for the people. Now, I did a bit of study or research and I found that that Greek word that is used for that deep compassion or that deep concern refers to your intestines or your bowl, uh, bowels. So it's, it's really deep in your spirit. On your end, I mean, it's, a, it's not just a, oh, shame, these poor people. It was a deep conviction he felt. It describes the pity and the compassion which moves a man in the very depths of his being. Now, Jesus experienced this deep emotion for the people who were tired and exhausted. The first part of that verse tells us that he healed their bodies and if there were sick people, he healed them. And if it was emotional abuse there or torment that they were subject to, he, he sorted out all their problems or challenges. But when he looked out over the crowd, he realized that there's a group of people, and I believe in my view, that were stuck in religion or in the snares of a working or a works-based mentality. These people were tired and they did not realize that there's a verse like in Psalm 23 where it says there's a good shepherd which leads you to green pastures and places where there's rest. When he looked out over this crowd, he realized but the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the, the Marutis of the day had the people tired. Because it was all about works. There were so many lists, things you had to tick off to get God's favor or to earn His favor. Now in Luke 4 verse 14 to 19, we read that Jesus spoke, He quoted a piece of scripture out of Isaiah in a synagogue and He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce release, pardon, forgiveness to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed, downtrodden, bruised, crushed by tragedy, uh, tragedy to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the favor of God abound greatly. Now this same Holy Spirit that rested on Jesus uh, that caused him to quote this piece of scripture and to say, hey, I came and I have the answer. I have the good news with me. That same spirit is within us. And we can go out to the world and into our daily circumstances and we can proclaim this good news. Good news. That's what the gospel means. Now in life work, we use Jesus as a role model and we like to, to see how did he interact 
with a few people. Now, there are four stories that I want to share with you, and I want us to just stand still with these four occurrences where, where Jesus encountered people. And the first of those stories was this woman at the well. Now, let me just refresh your memory. This woman had a shady past. This woman, if you invited her to your house and she showed up at the Bring and Bry, uh, your neighbors would have started gossiping. They would have started wondering, wow, does Sam know a lady like this? She had a shady past. And uh, whether she was a prostitute or just had this immoral lifestyle, we don't know. But we know that she went to fetch water in the middle of the day. And people didn't go and fetch water in the middle of the day. They went early in the morning or late in the afternoon because it's just so hot right in the middle of the day. Why did she go that time of the day? Because she knew she'll be alone. She knew that probably people who normally would throw stones at her and accusations and gossip behind her back hurt her with their words and finger pointing and pointing at all her sins, they won't be there in the middle of the day. What I love about this story is Jesus broke so many rules that day when he told his disciples, let's not walk around as is the custom. Let's go through. And I have an appointment with someone there. And as he got there, he sent them away and he started talking to this lady. So many rules, so many traditions he broke down because a Jewish man was not allowed to speak to a female in public if he was not married to her. Some of them didn't even speak to their wives in public. Jesus sat down and he started engaging with this lady. He started talking to her. I think he bulldozed her with love. She expected as all the other religious and the rabbis of the day would do, they would just point at her and say, Sis, look at your past. Look at the mess you have made with your life. Jesus didn't do it. He looked straight into our eyes and with love, you see, if you, grace is a person. And this lady experienced this acceptance, this love. And she became an evangelist after that. She ran back into town and she, all of a sudden, where she used to be scared of all these people and used to be shy, she went to gather crowds. And where they didn't intend on spending any time there, they ended up starting a crusade. I'm just wondering when the disciples got back to that well and they saw this commotion, what they must have thought. Jesus, what, what's wrong with you? How could you? This woman at the well met love. She met acceptance. The second person, and one of my heroes, uh, we can just call him because his name is so difficult, Zacchaeus. So let's just call him Zach. Now, Zach was short. Zach was slightly handicapped in that not only was he short, but he worked for SARS. <laughs> so he was not popular with the people either. And in that day, and especially some of the disciples, Jesus' church board, some of them were probably members of ISIS in today's terminology. Who makes you uncomfortable if you think, wow, if this person will have to sit next to me? If Jesus lived today and he picked this, uh, his disciples today, it would have been people that would have made you uncomfortable. Jesus' disciples didn't come out of seminary or synagogue or church. He picked them out of the marketplace and they rode on Harley Davidsons and they had piercings and tattoos or whatever it is that might make you slightly uncomfortable. Now, Zach was scared of some of these disciples and crowds because he betrayed his people. He collected taxes 
for the enemy. He ripped them off. He was seen as a cheat. So Zach had this longing, which no one knew about. He longed for friendship. And he heard these rumors, there's this new guy in town, and when you look into this guy's eyes, your heart just melts. This guy does not point out at your sins or your mistakes or your shortcomings, but he just accepts you. And Zach thought, well, maybe I'm crazy and maybe I'm risking my life, but there in the back of the crowds, I'm just going to look for a spot where I can hide and if I can just see this Jesus everyone is talking about, as he walks past, you know, maybe I can just catch a glimpse of him. Now, what blesses me of this story, remember Zach was short. And as he found himself at the back of these crowds, he could not see Jesus. But he saw that tree. It's a sycamore tree, a wild fig tree. And he decided, okay, let me climb up into this tree Hide in between the leaves. No one will see me, but at least I'll get a glimpse of Jesus. What I love about Jesus, as he's busy talking and chatting away, the next moment he points up into the tree and he says, Hey, Zach, the party is at your house tonight. I'm inviting myself over. Immediately he endorsed through friendship. Zach is my friend. I'm coming over and I'm visiting you at your house. Now, this you won't find in the scriptures, and I apologize to the pastors uh, in the room, but in my version of this story, I can, I can imagine that for a grown man to have climbed into this sycamore tree and for its branches to be strong enough to hold uh, the weight of a grown man, I actually did a bit of study on this, People say that this tree would have had to be at least 50 years old. So what blesses me, and this is my paraphrase, that 50 years and Zach was not even 50 yet. So before Zach was even born, I see God the Father calling an angel and telling the angel to put out his hand. And in his hand, he placed this small little seed of a sycamore tree. And he said, angel number 397... You need to go down to earth and next to that piece of road, you need to plant this tree. And for the next 50 years, this is your job. You need to protect the seed and you need to make sure that it gets just enough water, not too much. You need to make sure that none of the weeds will kill it. You have to make sure that fires or people that want to cut it down, no one will get close to this tree because... 50 years from now, there will be a moment where I can connect on a level of friendship with my son. The symbolism in the form of a tree. You see, God has done everything in His power and His ability to make that connection with you and I possible. He has put the tree in place and He put His son on it and he connected heaven and earth and he restored this level of friendship which no one in the Old Testament could have with the Father except for Adam and Eve. The Garden of Eden immediately is restored again and he's pointing at you and at me today and he's saying, the party is at your house. I'm coming over. You and I are going to be friends. Isn't that an amazing offering? Another example is the one day after they had massive crusades and Jesus was preaching away and the disciples had to feed everyone and just imagine all the logistics and the evacuation plans and health and safety and all those things that had to be in place for a gathering of 10 or 15,000 people. And one of those days, after everyone was very tired, Jesus said, okay, you guys get into this boat and we're going to cross over to the other side. Now the other side, and Gerrit mentioned the scripture uh, in the beginning when he welcomed us, the other side was the place where you did not go. It was the wrong side of the railway tracks. 
there the train is coming. <laughs> the other side was the place we did not go. As a Jew and as part of that custom of the day, you did not mingle with the type of people that lived there on the other side. But you see, Jesus had a mission. He was on a mission and he had a plan for an encounter with one guy. And as they then got into this boat reluctantly and there was a storm and Jesus had to quiet it down, as they got to the other side, they were greeted by this demoniac. This person foaming at the mouth, ready to tear them apart limb by limb. And the disciples must have thought, Jesus, why did you bring us here? We told you there are people like this here on the other side. Naked, foaming by the mouth. You can see this aggression. And Jesus spoke a few words, chased out the demons, and all of a sudden, another evangelist was born. This guy immediately wanted to get onto the boat with them. He was completely healed. Jesus delivered him out of his bondage, out of his circumstances. But he turned him down. He said, no, you can't come with us today. You have a different task, a different mission. Go back into your village and tell everyone what has happened to you. And this guy went into the village. The disciples, Jesus, got back into the boat and left. You see, the other side, Jesus made the effort to reach the people on the other side. Again, this dem demonized person who made everyone feel uncomfortable, no one wanted to get close to him, had an experience with love. Now, one morning, a few years ago, I was working from home, and the next moment, our dogs went crazy. Now, we used to have Great Danes, and uh, they're known as gentle giants, so they'll lick you to death. Uh, but that day, I realized I've never heard them barking as aggressively as they were. And as I walked outside, I saw a young lady, completely naked, covered in blood and bruises, and she was busy trying to climb over our Devil's Fork uh, palisade. We had electrical fence, so her head was like stuck, and she was being, you know, is it electrocuted or electrified? Um, and our dogs wanted to tear her apart. Long story short, she was on a drug uh, trip. She had no clue where she was, who she was, and demons were manifesting out of her. Now, I'm trying to control the dogs. I have no clue what am I going to do with this lady. And the next moment, the security vehicle stops in front of the house, and now I have some pleasing and explaining to do. How did this lady get up there? And the guy doesn't realize if she's trying to get away from me or... <laughs> You know, if she's trying to get in. So I quickly had to explain what's going on. And for close to three hours, we were chasing this lady around the neighborhood. She climbed over barbed wire fences. And I saw how the devil can cause damage to people's lives through addiction. And as we finally caught up with her... Um, she looked into my eyes and she said, I trust you. She saw something in my eyes, which I trust was light or peace, and she could make that connection. And another person or another story, and this was a, a story Jesus told to his disciples, was of the prodigal son. It was this guy that was so out of line that he approached his dad and said, Father, you're still alive, but I want my inheritance now. Give it all to me. And he took his inheritance and he went to squander it and he ended up in the pigsty. He, he messed up his life. And as he was on his way back to his father's house because he had nothing left, 
And if I could then just rather be a slave in my father's house, I'll be better off than here in the pigsty. On his way back, and this is what blesses me about the story, his father willingly broke all the traditions of the day as well. His father is a Jewish man. As he was looking out, so it, it tells us in this story, as his son was approaching, he saw him from far off. That means his father was standing, waiting, longing, wishing that his son would return home. He broke all traditions by picking up his robe or his dress and running. Jewish men did not run in public. Jewish men did not show their legs in public. Why would I have to humble myself or uh, be embarrassed? What would the neighbors say or think? This father couldn't care less. Picked up his robe and he ran. And as the son started making excuses... His dad just embraced him and he spinned him around and he ordered sandals and the best robe which belonged to the father to be put on him and hopefully perfumed because you can imagine how much he should have stank at that stage. The father kissed him, he put a ring on his finger, his authority was restored immediately. In those days, the, the contracts were signed before signatures with rings. He has restored his life. Now, what blesses me about that story immensely is in the English and in the Afrikaans Bibles, it's known as the parable, the story, the narrative of the prodigal son. It tells us about this son, about this guy that was so bad. Now, in the Asian Bibles, uh, specifically Mandarin, Chinese Bible, the heading they chose for this story is the parable of the running father. You see, they figured out, Jesus told this story and the focus, the punchline of this story is not how bad was the son. The bottom line is how good is the father. The parable of the running father. Now let me tell you, the enemy will try anything in his power to separate us from the loving Father. He will use religion, he will use broken homes, he will use divorce, he will use extramarital affairs, he will use bullies at school, he will even use a Sunday school teacher or a duomany or a pastor or a preach, preacher or a priest or someone in religious authority to try and tell you or convince you that you're worthless and that you're so bad and that nothing you can do can recover this relationship and you're not worth a relationship with that loving father. Let's face it, there are broken people all around us. They found in Sunnyside and they found in Silver Lakes. People are broken. People are separated from the loving Father. Now, I want to share a bit of my story. And I started at the retreat sharing a little bit of it. And there's a, there's a photo of the mini-me. That photo was taken of little Ruan on his first day to school. So that was in front of my grade one class. Now, if you look at that little boy and you look into his eyes and I look terrified, um, I have to say, Jeffrey De Lange at Dani Malan Law School had a reputation of being very strict. So I must have seen her and gotten the fright of my life. I want to tell you a little bit about this boy. That boy you see there grew up without a father. And the reason for that, his mom was married to an abusive alcoholic. And for 17 years, she didn't find love in his arms. And she started getting attention from her boss, her manager at work. And I was born 
as the product of the sex they had out of marriage. And when I found this out, that boy didn't know that at that stage, that boy just knew whoever his father was is not interested in him or knowing him. So I saw my biological father twice in my life. Um, when I was 12 years old for the first time, we had to, in secret, meet in the parking lot uh, of a shopping center. And he peeked through the window and he just said, oh, hi, you kind of look like your mother. And then one day in matric, I snuck behind my mom's back and I figured out where he's working and I made contact and I sat him down in a coffee shop and he didn't want anything to do with me. Now, that's his prerogative. I spoke to him once over the phone a week before our wedding and I invited him to our wedding and he said, what, you're getting married. Do you know how many marriages end in divorce? So I said, thank you very much. I wasn't phoning you for people for marriage advice. And two weeks later, he passed away from a heart attack. So he lost out on an amazing relationship he could have had with a son, me. You see, in my mind, and it, before I remind you again how I got saved or when I got saved, um, my mom basically then raised me and my two sisters alone. She had to do three jobs. We stayed in a small little flat, and um, my mom is great, and my sisters are also phenomenal. But as a five-year-old boy, I longed to have a relationship with a dad. And what I missed, what I saw from cousins or friends or people in the neighborhood, I saw dads kicking or throwing around balls with their sons. That was my longing. So if you look at that photo, you can see the longing of a boy that wanted to know a dad. And the, the guy, the gentleman, who worked in our garden at that stage when I was five years old, he saw the longing of this boy. And he started kicking around balls with me and started giving attention to me, but then he started inviting me into his room. And over the period of a year, he sexually molested me. So if you look at that boy, there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of baggage which he carried. And you can say, wow, that's unfair and he didn't deserve it. But let me tell you, there's an enemy that will do everything in his power to separate you from a loving father. And a few years after that image was taken, I was 10 years old and I went to visit a friend of mine on my bicycle and on my way back, on my bicycle, I started sobbing. I couldn't cope anymore. I started crying uncontrollably that I couldn't see where I was going with my bicycle. I pulled off on the pavement and I started sobbing. I was crying. And the next moment, I experienced the Heavenly Father tell me that I will be your dad. I will be your dad. The next moment, this weight was lifted from my shoulders. I was in an instant delivered from oppression, heaviness, whatever it might have been on my shoulders. And I was filled with peace and love beyond understanding. I will be your dad. You see, there are so many broken and bruised people around us. So many people have stories that you and I might not be aware of. People are broken. People are hurting. But there's a loving Father. There's a Father that's willing to embrace us and to say, you know what, 
doesn't matter what has gone wrong in your life. doesn't matter what you might have even done wrong. I'm here to embrace you and I have compassion over you. And may we today be challenged by testimonies that we can realize you and I are the hands, we're the feet, we're the salt, the light. We're the carriers of that love to people that might be separated and might not know this loving Father. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. Father, we thank you for your love. Unconditional, unending, enormous, extravagant love which you have for each one of us. Lord, and I pray that each and every person that can hear my voice at this moment in time, they might be struggling, they might have their own story, their own shortcoming. They might be like the woman at the well or Zacchaeus who was short. They might even be oppressed or in bondage of some sorts, like that guy who was demon-possessed. Or maybe someone identified with my story. Whatever the challenge might be, whatever the hurt might be that they're facing, Lord, my prayer is that they'll be overwhelmed by your love. Thank you for having compassion over us. Thank you for being interested in us. And thank you that we know that your heart breaks every time one of your children are hurt. Whenever bad things happen to us. Lord, and I pray that every person will be restored, will be invited into the loving arms of the Father.